Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. On the uh, first side of this tape, the subject is rising to mystical consciousness in prayer and treatment. And you will find that there is only one way in which you can rise to mystical consciousness. This is one of the straight and narrow paths in which there are not two methods or two approaches. There's only one. And rising into the mystical consciousness, there's only one way. Actually, this way has been known throughout all of the ages to every mystic. And you would imagine that because it has been taught so many times that by now we would all be established in the mystical consciousness. The fact of the matter is that the interest of the world has never yet been in the mystical consciousness, but in the fruits of it, what the Master called the loaves and fishes. The world has always wanted peace, but not that which would produce peace. The world has always wanted prosperity, but not that which produces prosperity. That they want to avoid. That's a terrible thing. They want health, but not that which will produce health. And therefore, the world has been taught to pray not for that which would give us peace, prosperity, and health, no, for, but for the peace, prosperity, and health itself, which cannot be attained. There is no way to attain these through prayer. And therefore, every prayer, whether it's been the Hebrew prayer or the Christian prayer or the Hindu prayer, the Vedantic prayer, or any other prayer, They've all been failures because they were aimed at the loaves and fishes, the things, instead of that which produces the things. Now, all creation comes forth from a source. And if you have the source, you can have the creation. But there is no way to get the creation separate and apart from the source of the creation. It would be as if uh, you wanted a desk. And you set your mind on having a desk. And someone says to you, oh, but uh, you must have a piece of wood first. Oh, don't bother me with that. Don't bother me with that. I, I'm on a desk. I know, but, uh, well, nothing. I'm on a desk. But there is no such thing as a desk until you have the wood. No, well, then they go and look for another teaching one that will get them the desk without getting the wood. And so we go from one teaching to another and one church to another, always because we want health and we want supply and we want happiness and we want contentment and we want peace. But don't have anybody waste our time with the fabric of which these are made. 
Now the fabric of life is consciousness. The fabric of life is spiritual consciousness. And if you want the forms of life, you must have its fabric first, the consciousness. Once you have the consciousness, you can have all the things added. Go and get yourself a nice great big tree and you can have the desk. And you can have a chair too. And you can have shelves too. This has always been known. And in every age someone has taught it. Jesus taught it by saying, take no thought for your life or the loaves and the fishes or what you shall eat or what you shall drink or wherewithal you shall be clothed. Seek the realm, the inner realm, the kingdom of God, consciousness. The things will be added unto you. And of course, that was dropped. And so we go into the church and say, uh, give me rent. Give me peace. Give me health. And they're praying for every blessed thing in the world except the one thing that he told them to pray for, the kingdom of God, the realm, consciousness. Now, back here in uh, around 1000, 1100, Maimonides one of the great, great Hebrews who today isn't even recognized by his church, except by the few scholars. He said the same thing. And uh, in saying it, he put it into words which you're going to find very familiar, because it's the essence of the infinite way. Although as far as we're concerned, the words only got here this week in a newly published book. First let me read these words and then we'll go to the infinite way. The chief, oh excuse me, this is from Maimonides' teachings. The chief reason why it is so urgent to establish the belief in God's incorporeality is supplied by the fact that that belief is destructive of idolatry. It was, of course, universally known that idolatry is a very grave sin, nay, that the law has, so to speak, no other purpose than to destroy idolatry. But this evil can be completely eradicated only if everyone is brought to know that God has no visible shape whatever or that he is incorporeal. Only if God is incorporeal is it absurd to make images of God and to worship such images. Only under this condition can it become manifest to everyone that the only image of God is man, living and thinking man, and that man acts as the image of God only through worshiping the invisible or hidden God alone. Now, do you see the difficulty that metaphysicians have in healing work when you stop to realize that, although they of course recognize the incorporeality of God, they do not recognize the incorporeality of man, and therefore 
they are dealing with a structural man who has bones and a brain and liver and heart and lungs. And consciously or unconsciously, when they give a treatment, they are hoping to bring down the fever or remove the lump or set the bones. And thereby, they are blocking the entire treatment. They are setting up a barrier between God and man. Because incorporeal God can give birth only to incorporeal man. Incorporeal man has no physical structure. And therefore, those on the mystical path must in their meditation, prayer, and treatment remove from thought the image man, the corporeal man, the man who has physicality, because that is not the man of God's creating. Therefore, prayer, which really is the uh, union of God and man, communion between God and man, can never take place between incorporeal God and corporeal man. And it is for this reason that Paul was able to give us so clear a teaching on the natural man receiveth not the things of God. The moment you go to God with the idea of attaining a thing, I don't care whether it's supply or companionship or a new lung. The moment you go to God with something of a physical nature, in thought, you yourself are separated from God, and you're maintaining that same state of separation for your patient or your student. In other words... I know that if I look out here with my eyes, I can be aware only of corporeal man. I know that. I know that that natural part of me, the five physical senses, can only be aware of the five physical senses of you. I know that. But if I am limited to that consciousness then I have no right to be uh, a metaphysical practitioner or teacher. And I have no right to be claiming mysticism. In other words, there is a physical being, a body, and there are people who live completely at a physical level of life. They earn their living by their muscles. And they get all their pleasures in and through the body. And they have all their pains in and through the body. And then there are those who have uh, gone much further than that. And they have become the mental and physical man. They now have a mental awareness. They not only know the body, but they know beauty. And they know benevolence. And they know joys. And they know the mental things of life. They now have uh, a capacity for culture, for refinement, for education, for art, for literature, for science. But uh, they are not the whole man. Because every one of us, just as we have not only a physical sense of being and a mental sense, Everyone has within themselves a spiritual sense. But it is uh, hidden from view, even from their own view. It has never been awakened. It's, it's not asleep in them. They are asleep to it. It is never asleep. The Christ of us is never asleep in us. The Christ of us is always on its job and awake. But we are asleep to it. We are unaware of it. It is there. See that? It is there. We are unaware of it. 
just as throughout my lifetime I had a capacity uh, for all the wisdom that is in this library. But up to a certain age, I had no access to it because I had no awareness of it, and all of this was hidden from me. Up to a certain age, I had no knowledge that any of this existed. Why? I had the capacity for it, but I didn't know it. Therefore, I had no access to it. At a certain period, I became aware of this capacity, and from then on, the capacity was practiced, brought into life. So it was that throughout all of my lifetime, I must have had a spiritual uh, healing consciousness. But I didn't know it. I was just as materialistically minded as anybody else and lived as materialistically as anybody else because I knew nothing about this thing that was uh, somewhere. And then on a certain day, it burst forth, and the next day I was doing healing work. All right, the point is this, then. We are a physical being, we are a mental being, and we are an incorporeal spiritual being. And the reality of us is the incorporeal spiritual spiritual selfhood which was born of God. This other part of us is uh, the second chapter of creation which was made not by God but by mind, what they called the Lord God, mind, the mind of man really. Therefore, if I am to acknowledge God, I must acknowledge incorporeal God. And that means a God not only that I cannot embrace in a figure, I cannot even embrace it in a mental image. Therefore, I dare not even name it. Because if I call it spirit, I have made an image of what I think God is. If I call it mind, I have made an image of what I think God is. Even if I call it love, I have made an image. And the result is that not only there are 30 odd synonyms in common use for God, but not one of them will heal a headache. Why? They are mental concepts. They are not God. And the only way in which I can know God is by knowing that I cannot know God. That God cannot be embraced in my mind. Therefore, I come back to that which Maimonides also said. If you say that God is power, all might, all power. And if you say that God is love, and if you say that God is good, you are saying no more than when you say God is. So it is. Once you acknowledge that God is, you are inferentially declaring that God is infinity, God is omniscience, God is omnipotence, God is omnipresence. But how could you ever think what the word omniscience means? How could you ever embrace in your mind what all power means? You can't. Therefore, release it and let it go and do not try to understand God. Do not try to uh, embrace God in your mind. How then are we to know God aright? Ah, that we can do. We can know God aright. God is. And then, let God define himself, itself. And all of a sudden, 
as you are busy not knowing, all of a sudden you are aware of the fact that something is saying to you, I am God. And you look around and wonder who said it and where are they? And you'll discover they were in your chest. Ah, no, the next minute you'll turn around and say, no, no, it was right over my left shoulder. And just about that time it fools you because it talks up to you from down on the floor. And then you let go and say, "Uh uh-huh, I cannot be confined inside of me or outside of me. It's neither inside nor outside. Because to God, how can there be an inside and an outside? Inside of what and outside of what? There'd have to be something greater than God to encompass it. And so you'll come to the realization that in the end, you cannot know God, but God can announce himself to you. God can say, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. God can say, I was with thee before Abraham was. God can say, I will be with thee to the end of the world. And all you'll ever know about God is the word I. That word I keeps repeating itself over and over and over again. Fear not, I am with thee. And then you'll know that you know God aright. Because you can't see I You can't hear I, you can't taste I, you can't smell I, you can't touch I, you can't draw pictures of I, you can't even visualize what I am like. Now, when you have reached that, you are ready for the mystical side of life. Because... When you realize that I and my Father are one, you'll know that I also am incorporeal, infinite. You'll know that all that God is, I am. And then you'll discover why it is that in our work right from the beginning, It has been possible to write to me from any part of the world or cable me and get a healing before the message reaches me. And that is because I have recognized my incorporeality. I have recognized that I am not sitting here in this body. I am speaking through the body, but I am not in the body. I am where you are, and it makes no difference whether it's any place between Cape Town and London. makes no difference whether it's anywhere between uh, Detroit and the southern end of South America. That's where I am, because I and my father are one, not two. And wherever God is, I am. And whatever the nature of God is, is the nature of my being. And therefore, without taking thought, and without directing thought, anyone who makes contact with that spirit which I am has made contact with their source. Well, eventually they're going to learn that they made contact with themselves. Because the I that I am is the you that you are. Now, one time in uh, one of my deeper meditations, when uh, I was in the actual incorporeality of myself, in full awareness of it, I saw that I could incarnate as a male or a female would make no difference. I myself am neither male nor female. God is neither male nor female, and there is only one I. 
Therefore, it would make no difference at all whether the next time I appeared as a male or a female. And this will explain something else to you. Why is it <clears throat> that before 1492 or somewhat after that, There were no white people on this continent, on the North American continent. And yet, every one of you and I existed. We live because we've never had a beginning. You can't coexist with God and have a beginning. You can't have an ending. So that you've always lived, and you've always lived somewhere, but you weren't living on this continent. Well, this you will also discover when you attain the incorporeal sense of your being. You will know that if you uh, existed in Africa, you were black, and if you existed in India, you were copper, or if you existed in Arabia, you were dark. If you existed in the Holy Lands in the time of Jesus, you were very dark. If you were in uh, uh, China or Japan, you were Oriental. You say, I? Sure. Yes, I. Who else but I? Is there any but I? And has there ever been a time when I was not manifest? Was there ever an unmanifested I? So therefore, I has always been. And so it is that should there be uh, life on other planets, which there must be, we have no way of knowing what form that life is. But be assured, I am incorporeal and I am on those other planets. Should we manifest there, we are going to manifest in that form of life. And it'll be nothing like what we look like now. So always remember, once you recognize the incorporeal nature of your being, you will then understand why it could be taught there's neither Greek nor Jew. See that? You'll know why there's neither black nor white, there's neither copper nor red, there's neither oriental nor occidental. Those are merely the forms we assume in order to fit into our surroundings. Now, there was a time when the worm was a worm and had the body of a worm. And then there's the time when the worm is a butterfly and has the body of a butterfly, but it's the same life. Different forms. We could go back to the phoenix and discover that just as the phoenix lives as form and then becomes dust and then lives again, it was the same life when it was dust. Same life when it was ashes, otherwise it could not have uh, formed again. Now, you know what I'm leading up to? You never, never will do good spiritual healing work until you attain the inner awareness of the incorporeal nature of man's being. The only image there is of God is man. God appears as man. But since God is incorporeal, man is incorporeal. The fact that he has a corporeal body doesn't make him corporeal. The fact that he has an automobile doesn't make him an automobile. The fact that he travels in an airplane doesn't make him an airplane. And the fact that he travels in a body 
uses a body, has a body, doesn't make him a body. Man himself is the same incorporeality that God is. Because they are one and not two. It is God itself that is living man's life. And it is for this reason, since I and my Father are one, all that the Father hath must be mine. And that is why it is given to us, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. And there's the word I again. Everything that is embodied in the word I is the truth about you. Therefore, you not only, to live mystically, must live as I, but be assured that you cannot teach or heal except as you recognize that I am I, whether I'm sitting on this side of the table or that. And therefore, in teaching, I am never talking down to anyone out here. I am talking to myself and reminding myself of the truth I know. I'm not addressing you. I'm addressing myself. And because myself is you, I'm hearing myself. Now, if you have yourself as a teacher and someone else as a student, you will not get across. You will not get across. Because you will be setting up two-ness, I and thou. And that will be like the righteous man, you know, who tried to get into heaven and found there wasn't room there. And had to finally come to the realization that he wasn't himself, he was really God. Then there was room. So it is. The moment that I would speak to you as students... We have to use the designation teacher and students merely uh, as classification. But the moment a teacher thinks of a student as a student, they have set up the barrier of Tunis and they can't get across. It is when the teacher recognizes that God is I. And there is only one I. Therefore, all that I am imparting, I am receiving. I may be imparting it as Joel and receiving it as uh, Bill. But it's all taking place within the I that I am. And so it is. And you have to watch this because you can get fooled by what we call everyday living because somebody sooner or later will say to you that you have to be common sense. And if you are, you're going to lose your demonstration. Now, you can make yourself common sense to the outside world. And that really, you must do that. Uh, you must not try to make the unillumined understand illumination. but within yourself don't get common sense. In other words, when you are, we'll just say using money, whether spending it or giving it or anything else, do not accept the belief that you are passing it on to somebody else. Because you're not. There's only one self. And you are transferring it only from your right-hand pocket to your left-hand pocket. And you have just as much after you've given it away as you had before you gave it away. Because you didn't give it away. Mm -mm. You transferred pockets. 
or you transferred it from one bank account to another bank account, but it's always still in your name. The name is I. I. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Therefore, I, Joel, have nothing. All that the Father hath is mine. But it's still the Father's. And so when I give it away, it's still the Father's. It hasn't changed ownership one single bit. And as long as I live in that consciousness, I can have infinity. Because I can give away infinity and have infinity. Because never has it transferred its ownership, its title, from God. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And as long as I can live in that consciousness, I can give, I can share, I can impart without lessening my own. Now, you won't believe this until you can believe in incorporeality. And now let me show you how you will believe it in, incorpor in that which you understand to be incorporeal. Let us take the subject of truth. I am now imparting truth. It isn't mine. You understand that? It's God's. Flowing through me. And I am imparting it. Now, when I get through this morning imparting it, will I have less or will I have more? And you know the answer. I will have more. The very act of imparting this is multiplying it within me. Well, you say, that's right. Truth is incorporeal. Therefore, you cannot have less than you started with. All right, let's take love. A parent loves a child. And from morning to night, it pours love upon the child. And from night to morning, it pours love upon the child. When does the mother have less love? Oh, no, it can't have less love. By the very act of loving, it has increased its capacity for love. School teachers, they're always imparting knowledge. When do they begin to have less knowledge? Oh, no, by imparting knowledge, they have more. You say, oh, I agree with that. Why do you agree with it? Well, you're recognizing the incorporeal nature of knowledge, of wisdom, of truth, of love. Ah, but money. Ah, you see, we have accepted a corporeal sense of supply. And so every time we spend a dollar, we have a dollar less. Every time we give a dollar, we have a dollar less. But it need not be, because supply is not corporeal. We entertain a false sense of supply. Once we have the right sense that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and all that the Father hath is mine, it becomes incorporeal. And the moment it is incorporeal, The more I give, the more I have. All right? Now we come back to health. Now just watch what happens. The moment that you accept a corporeal sense of existence, you are fighting the calendar. And every day that passes over your head, you are a day older, a day weaker, a day less living. And you don't wonder then that we reach the age of incapacity and all the rest of it. Now see the difference when you begin to accept 
not only the incorporeality of God, but the incorporeality of man. Do you know that every day that we live, uh, we get younger and stronger? The more of life we use, the more we have. And if we accept this, by the time we get to be 70, we should go back to short trousers. That's why I have them on, you see. <laughs> Do you not see this? That you cannot possibly engage in a spiritual ministry while you are living out from a corporeal sense of existence. You're making mockery of it. And you're not hurting this world, you're hurting yourself. You're just setting up a barrier to the harmony of your own existence unless you can come to this place where you can say, the only image of God I can ever see is man. And that has to be as incorporeal. Now, when you're in this ministry, healing is not too difficult because you don't have bones to set, you don't have fevers to reduce, you don't have digestive systems to change, you don't have false appetites to get rid of or sins to overcome, and you don't have to go around preaching you shouldn't smoke and you shouldn't drink. None of this comes into your ministry because you are dealing with an incorporeal God manifest as an incorporeal man. And you are living and moving and having your being in the consciousness of this. Therefore, you do not permit your ministry to deal with man whose breath is in his nostril. You don't tell him he should be more loving or more generous or more kind. You don't tell him he should treat his mother-in-law better or his wife. You, you do not interfere in his human affairs to any extent. You allow your student, your patient, to present any pictures they want to you. But you are careful that you do not want to change them. That you have this spiritual capacity, we've called it discernment, and we've called it soul faculties. All right. If you are the human being who has only a physical body and a mind, then, of course, everything that I'm saying to you cannot make sense. None of this can make sense because you have no capacity with which to receive it. In other words, in this ministry, in this life, spiritual life, unless you have uh, this additional faculty, none of this can make sense because all of this is contrary to human sense, to human knowledge. And it is for this reason I have brought out to our students all through the years that it was on a specific day, late in 1928, when this spiritual thing awakened, that all of a sudden I was doing healing work and all of a sudden I wasn't smoking and all of a sudden I wasn't drinking and all of a sudden I wasn't playing cards. Now, it wasn't that I got good. Heaven forbid. I wouldn't have known how to do that. It was that this faculty awakened and then began a, a very unhappy period in my life because I was two people. The old man wasn't completely dead. And so there was a warfare between the two. And not only that, but I had not been weaned away from those who could only see me this way, humanly, physically. And therefore, 
they were seeing me this way and I was seeing them that way. And the same with business. I had a hard time with business. I ended up as broke as anyone has ever been for the simple reason that I was trying to live in a corporeal sense of supply and demonstrate incorporeal supply, and you can't do it. You just tear yourself to pieces. And it was only when I had absolutely no corporeal supply that at least I could say, well, now, now I'm all right. Now, now I had nothing to come in conflict with. And then the flow could begin the other way. Therefore, do not try to impart this too soon to your student. Be gentle. Be gentle. Come up through the principles to where they also begin to show that they are seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, and smelling incorporeally. In other words, that they have spiritual discernment. And then, as uh, they show forth the spiritual discernment, then you can go the full route that we are going now and from now on with those who are ready for it. We are starting today <clears throat> the unfoldment, carrying the incorporeality of God into the incorporeality of man, to the incorporeality of body and the incorporeality of supply. Now, I can prove to you in one second that all supply is incorporeal. Yes, there over there is uh, on our lawn is a banana tree. But it has no bananas on it. Where are the bananas? Because one of these days they are going to be there. Visible, tangible, touchable. Now where are they now? Don't tell me they don't have existence. They must have. If they don't have existence, how are we ever going to see them? And so you'll know. All supply is incorporeal. When it appears visibly, we attach an in a corporeal sense to them. They are as present now as they ever will be. Isn't there? Doesn't the Master give us something on that? Before it's in the ground? Seeds before they're in the ground? Why, you know right well that before there was a seed, there was incorporeality. A seed even has to come out of something, doesn't it? Out of what? Out of what? What does a seed come forth from? You don't know any more than I do, except that I can tell you the name of what it comes out of. The name is consciousness. Consciousness is the fabric and the substance of all form. And consciousness is incorporeal. And as it manifests, we attach an, a corporeal sense to it. But it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. It is possible in spiritual discernment to behold the incorporeal form. I have beheld the incorporeal form of man hundreds upon hundreds of times. Loads of people in this world have witnessed the incorporeal form of man. Because when you're in the spirit, 
That's all you can behold. That's how originally somebody said that men are equal. Now, they didn't say that judging from appearances, because at all times there were the kings and the slaves. At all times there were the generals and the privates. At all times there were the bond and the free. At all times there was the Jew and the Greek. So if you were to judge from appearances, no one could ever have said. Always there were the literate and the illiterate. Always there was the spiritual and the unspiritual. So if you're going to judge from appearances and say that all men are equal, well, I think it's kind of nonsensical myself. I, I myself have traveled this world and looked at a lot of people and said, uh, it's kind of difficult to believe that all men are equal. See that? Then how did we get the vision that all men are equal? From whence came this vision? Remember, the Greeks were the mighty intellectuals. The Jews were the illiterates. And yet, someone with vision said, there shall be neither Greek nor Jew, but all equal. Now, whoever said that, do you think? 2,000 years ago. Think of the Greeks of 2,000 years ago. Think of the Jews of 2,000 years ago. And think what kind of a vision somebody must have said, must have had, in order to say, there shall be neither Greek nor Jew, all men are equal. There shall be neither bond nor free. Think of the slaves of 2,000 years ago pulling those oars. And then think of Caesar and saying there shall be neither bond nor free because all men are equal. Do you see what I'm trying to say to you? That without spiritual intuition, without spiritual vision, discernment, you cannot see the real things of life. You can only judge by appearances. And you're going to be fooled. The crippled man is going to stay a crippled man. The woman taken in adultery is still going to be a woman taken in adultery. Unless you have spiritual vision that can perceive behind the physical sense and see the incorporeal man and woman, and trees and fruits and uh, crops, because they're all incorporeal. But we entertain a material sense of them. And your metaphysician, who has not succeeded in uh, the ministry, either in healing uh, people or demonstrating supply or bringing forth fruitage, has failed only because they had an incorporeal God called Spirit and they were trying to make it manifest corporeally. And there is no corporeal creation. We entertain a corporeal sense of an incorporeal creation. And so it is that everybody that has ever made an image of God Everybody that has ever made an image of Christ has been guilty of idolatry. But everybody who ever invented a word for God has been guilty of the same idolatry. Because a word is only an image in thought. Just like a figure is an image externally, a word is an image in thought. And anybody who's worshipping an image in thought has idolatry. Therefore, to know God aright, I must be unknowing. But to know man aright, I must be equally unknowing. To know supply aright, I must be equally unknowing. I must never be, de be dealing with corporeality in my spiritual ministry. Then I have attained the mystical consciousness out of which all form appears. 
you may then uh, entertain a corporeal sense of that form but at least you will have the satisfaction of knowing that it isn't corporeal. You will have the satisfaction of knowing that out of you can't get something out of nothingness. And therefore, the fabric of life, which is consciousness, which is incorporeal, appears as incorporeal form. And then even if you do continue... Uh, to see it corporeally, it will not fool you. Even though you handle dollar bills, they won't fool you. You'll know that you're not dealing with corporeality, which is limited. You're dealing with a manifestation of supply, which is infinite. And you'll know that since I am I, it doesn't make any difference who I give it to, I still own it. I still have it. I cannot give it away. It cannot get outside of the I that I am. Well, you see that rising to mystical consciousness in prayer and treatment means rising into incorporeality. And you must start with an incorporeal God whom you cannot see, hear, taste, touch, smell, or think. Be sure of that last. You can't think it. You can know God aright, as long as you're not thinking about God. And if you stop with an incorporeal God, uh, your ministry will only bring forth the fringes of uh, demonstration of healing. The moment you have incorporeal man and you drop his structural appearance, you'll stop trying to reduce his fevers or his lumps. Do you see? You'll, try, you'll stop trying to stop his uh, aging processes. Because incorporeal man hasn't any. He was never born and he will never die. He was never born so he can't age. And when you have that man as your ministry, you've got to have healings. And when you have incorporeal supply, consciousness as the substance of form, whose consciousness? mine. There's only one. Only one consciousness. My consciousness is the substance of this universe. Because God is my consciousness. Well, I think we shall retire from the teaching business after today because there's nothing left to teach. I mean, you can't go beyond incorporeality. You can't. You have to be left to bring forth incorporeality out of your consciousness. Out of your own consciousness, bring forth incorporeal man, an incorporeal body, an incorporeal supply. Thank you. Thank you. I'm